This is going to be a reading of Our Authorized Bible Vindicated by Benjamin G. Wilkinson, Ph.D., Dean of Theology, Washington Missionary College, Tacoma Park, D.C., Washington, D.C., written in June 1930. I believe this man was a Seventh-day Adventist. Our Authorized Bible Vindicated Forward. This volume is written in the fervent hope that it will confirm and establish the faith in God's word which through the ages has been preserved inviolate. In these days when faith is weakening and the Bible is being torn apart, it is vital that we enter into, into fields which can yield up their evidence of how God through the centuries intervened to transmit to us a perfect Bible. Much of the material given in this book was collected in response to the needs of the author's classroom work. In pursuing this line of study, he has been astounded and thrilled to find in historical situations where he least expected it evidences of special intervention and special purposes of God with regard to his holy word. His faith in the inspiration of the Bible has been deeply strengthened, and he has perceived how down through the ages God's true Bible has constantly triumphed over erroneous versions. With regard to the different versions, it is necessary while confirming the glorious inspiration of the Bible, to warn the people against Bibles which include the false books, which include false books, and especially at the present time against the dangers of false readings in genuine books. There are versions of the Bible prepared by men of scholarship with certain books and readings we cannot accept. Such versions may be of use for reference or for comparison. In certain passages, they may give us a clear rendering, but it is unthinkable that those who use such versions would be unwilling to have the public informed of their dangers. This work has been written under great pressure. In addition to the author's tasks in the theological department of the college and his evangelical work as pastor of a city church, he wrote this book in response to urgent requests. It may be possible that there are a few technical mistakes. The author has strong confidence, however, that the main lines of argument are timely and that they stand on a firm foundation. It is possible to know what is the true word of God. The author sends forth this book with a fervent prayer that it may aid and the earnest seeker after truth, that it may aid the earnest seeker after truth to find the answer to this all important question i.e., where is, thus saith the Lord, the word of God, the final authority for Christians. I added that last sentence in summary of what this question he alludes to. And that is B.G. Wilkinson, Tacoma Park, D.C., June 1930. So as we read this, bear in mind, I believe he's going to deal with some of the false Bible versions. Most of them that are in common use today came after this date of 1930 when this book was written so know that they're of a similar vein they come from the same vein and with the same agendas so this is equally applicable to all the other new versions as this author will at least elucidate that there are only two streams of bibles contents this is the index the chapters that we'll be going through Number one, chapter one, fundamentally only two different Bibles. Number two, the Bible adopted by Constantine and the pure Bible of the Waldenses. Number three, the reformers reject the Bible of the papacy. Number four, the Jesuits and the Jesuit Bible of 1582. Number five, the King James Bible born amid the great struggles over the Jesuit version. Number six, Comparisons to show how the Jesuit Bible reappears in the American Revised Version. Number 7. 300 years of attack on the King James Bible. Number 8. 
how the Jesuits captured Oxford University. Number 9. Westcott and Hort. Number 10. Revision at last. Number 11. Blow after blow against the truth. Number 12. Blow after blow in favor of Rome. Number 13. Catholics rejoice that the Revised Version vindicates their Catholic Bible. Number 14. The American Revision Committee. Its influence upon the future of America. Number 15. The rising flood of modernism and modern Bibles. Number 16. Conclusion. So, let us begin. Chapter 1. Fundamentally, only two different Bibles. There is the idea in the minds of some people that scholarship demands the laying aside of the authorized version of the Bible, that's the King James Version, and taking up the latest revised version, which today would be the you know, New King James, uh, NASB, uh, NLT, whatever uh, translation has come since. This is an idea, however, without any proper basis. This revised version is in large part in line with what is known as modernism and is peculiarly acceptable to those who think that any change anywhere or in anything is progress. Those who have really investigated the matter are in a hearty sym sympathy with what is evangelical and that are in a hearty sympathy with what is evangelical realize that this revised version is a part of the movement to quote-unquote modernize, which you could basically say ecumenicalize, Christian thought and faith and do away with the established truth. And that was evidently a quote, and that came from the Herald and Presbyter, a Presbyterian source, July 16th, 1924, page 10. In one of our prominent publications, there appeared in the winter of 1928 an article entitled, Who Killed Goliath? And in the spring of 1929 named, The Dispute About Goliath. Attention was called to the fact that in the American Revised Version, 2 Samuel 21, 19, we read that, Elhanan killed Goliath. A special cablegram from the, quote, most learned and devoted scholars, unquote, of the Church of England said in substance that the revised version was correct, that Elhanan did, and not David, killed Goliath. And there were many other things in the Bible which were the product of exaggeration, such as the story of Noah in the ark, of Jonah in the whale, of the garden of Eden, and of the longevity of Methuselah. The first article says that these modern views have been held and taught in, in practically all American theological seminaries of standing, and that young ministers, being graduated from them, have rejected the old beliefs about these events, whether the public knew it or not. So, that goes to show you in 1924, all the so-called seminaries and uh, America were apostate and had departed from a little reading of the Bible. This publication aroused a national interest in its office, and its office was, quote-unquote, inundated, as the editor says, with letters as to whether this revised version is correct, or whether, as we have always believed, according to the authorized version, that David killed Goliath. Is the American Revised Version correct on this point, or is the Bible, which has led the Protestant world for 300 years correct? 400 years now. Is the Revised Version correct and thousands of other changes made, or is the King James Version correct? Back of this and other changes lies in the motives uh, and events which in 1870 brought into existence the committees which produced the Revised Version both the English and the American, during the, th and the NIV and everything else that follow. I add. 
And just to um, give a couple demonstrations of where I'm aware of Jesuits specifically being involved in modern translations, um, the NIV had a Jesuit on its translation committee named uh, uh, Cardinal Carlos Martini. And, um, or it was Carlo Martini. And, um, in the Jehovah's Witness, uh, interlinear, um, kingdom interlinear, it's called, uh, that's like their interlinear for their new world Bible, new world translation, new world order translation, I call it. Um, it admits that there was two Jesuit priests that were involved in translating their Bible, the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation. Um, now, and I'll just add here, I have a buddy that believes in the um, the literal standard version Bible. Um, he thinks that that is an accurate word for word. Rendering of the Texas Receptus. Um, I cannot say for sure, but what I can say for sure is um, 11 days ago today, I emailed Covenant Press, who is the publisher, um, that I found their email on their website for the uh, Literal Standard Bible. And um, I asked them um, uh, for... Uh, I indicated I was hoping to find out a name of the men who were on the translation committee so I could look into their backgrounds and see who was part of this. And no one got back to me at all for what that's worth. Take that for what it's worth. 11 days later, I haven't heard back. So. During the 350 years of following the Reformation, repeated attempts were made to set aside the Greek New Testament called the Received Text from which the New Testament of the King James in English and other Protestant Bibles in other languages were translated. And the same is t true today of those that try to assert that the New Testament must have originally been written in Hebrew or Aramaic. Which, of course, there's plenty of evidence proving is untenable. Many individual efforts produce different Greek New Testaments. Likewise, furious attacks were made upon the Old Testament in Hebrew, from which the King James and other Bibles had been translated. None of these assaults, however, met with any marked success until the Revision Committee was appointed by the southern half of the Church of England under the Archbishop of Canterbury, although the same church in the northern half of England under the Archbishop of York refused to be a party to the project. This revision committee, besides the changes in the Old Testament, made over 5,000 changes in the received text of the New Testament and so produced a new Greek Testament. This permitted all the forces hostile to the Bible to gather themselves together and pour through uh, the breach and to pour through the breach. Since then, the floodgates have been open, and we are now deluged with many different kinds of Greek New Testaments, and with English Bibles translated from them, changed and mutilated in bewildering confusion, or Babylon. So where the word Babylon comes from, confusion. Again, in the story of the dark hour when Jesus hung on the cross, the King James Bible declares that the darkness which was over the whole land from the 6th to the ninth hour was produced because the sun was darkened. This reason offers the Christian hour whoops. This reason offers the Christian believer a testimony of the miraculous interposition of the Father in behalf of his son, similar to the darkness which afflicted Egypt in the plagues upon that nation in the new testament as translated by moffat and certain other modern bibles we are told that the darkness was caused by an eclipse of the sun of course darkness caused by an eclipse of the sun is very ordinary it is not a miracle 
Uh, I would add, I know according to Jonathan Gray's research, um, the sun was actually on the opposite side of the moon when this all took place, and that I'm sure that could be astronomically verified. Then, therefore, an eclipse was not even possible. Moreover, Christ was crucified at the time of Passover, which always occurred when the moon was full. At the time of the full moon, no eclipse of the sun is possible. Now, which of these two records, in Greek, did God write? The miraculous, as recorded in the King James Bible, in which we have believed for 300 years, or the unnatural and impossible, as recorded in Moffat's translation. Moffat and the revisers both used the same manuscript. Some of those who had part in the revised and modern Bibles were higher critics of the most pronounced type. At least one man sat on the revision committee of 1881, who had openly and in writing denied the divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. On this account, their chairman of high standing ab ab absented himself almost from the first. Also, men sat on the revision committee who openly and in a critical hour, when their word was of weight, had def defended the great movement to Romanize the Church of England. That would be the Oxford movement. It is too late to beguile us with soothing words that all versions and all translations are of equal value, that nowhere is doctrine affected. Doctrine is seriously affected. So wrote Dr. G. V. Smith, a member of the English New Testament Revision Committee. Quote, Since the publication of the Revised New Testament, it has been frequently said that the changes of translation which the work contains are of little importance from a doctoral point of view. To the writer, any such statement appears to be in the most substantial sense contrary to the facts of the case, unquote. Life is bigger than logic. When it comes to the philosophy of life, scholarship and science are not the tell-all which counts. It is true today, as in the day of Christ, that, quote, the common people heard him gladly, unquote. If it be a question of physics, of chemistry, of mathematics, or of mechanics, there scientists can speak with authority. But when it is a question of revelation, of spirituality, of morality. The common people are as competent judges as are the product of the schools. And in the great crisis, history has frequently shown they were safer, that they were safer. Experience also determines issues. There are those among us now who would change the Constitution of the United States, saying, Have we not men today? who have as great intellect as Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and others? Have we not much more light than they? Why must we be tied to what they taught? Unquote. We will not deny that there are men now living as brilliant as the Founding Fathers, but no men today ever went through the same experience as the framers of the Constitution. Those pioneers were yet witnesses of the vicious principles of the Dark Ages, and their cruel results. They were called upon to suffer, to endure, to fight, that principles of a different nature might be established. Experience, not reading or philosophizing, had thoroughly wrought in them the glorious ideas incorporated into the fundamental doctrine of the land. Experience can show Experience can throw some light also upon the relative value of Bible versions. The King James Bible was translated when England was fighting her way out from, the, from Catholicism to Protestantism, whereas the Revised Version was born after 50 years, 1833 to 1883, of terrific Romanizing campaigns, when one convulsion after another rocked the mental defenses of England and broke down the ascendancy of the Protestant mentality in the empire. And of course, most of these most commonly used uh, 
alternate Bible versions today come post uh, Vatican II's uh, ecumenical movement, the establishment of the World Council of Churches, and all this other ecumenism. The King James Version was born of the Reformation. The Revised Version and some modern Bibles were born of higher criticism and Romanizing activities, as this treatise will show. We hear a great deal today about the Sunday Law of the Roman Emperor Constantine, 321 AD. Why is it that we do not hear about the corrupt Bible which Constantine adopted and promulgated? the version which for 1,800 years has been exploited by the forces of heresy and apostasy. So this author is referring to being a Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventists are well aware that Constantine uh, uh, enacted the first Sunday laws. This is very e easily verifiable. It's a common historical fact, um, proving that Sunday laws are a very real thing. Uh, but Seventh-day Adventists aren't aware that he had a corrupt Bible that became common use. This Bible, we regret to say, lies at the bottom of many versions which now flood the publishing houses, the schools, the churches, yes, many homes, and are bringing confusion and doubt to untold millions. Down through the centuries, the pure Bible, the living Word of God, has often faced the descendants of of this corrupt version, robed in splendor and seated on the throne of power. It has been a battle and a march, a battle and a march. God's holy word has always won. To its victories we owe the very existence of Christian civilization and all the happiness we now have and hope for in eternity. And now, once again, in these last days, the battle is being renewed. The affections and the control of the minds of men are being contended for by these two rival claimants. Devotion to error can never produce true righteousness. Out of the present confusion of Bibles, I, pur I purpose to trace the situation back to its origin, that our hearts may be full of praise and gratitude to God for the marvelous manner in which he has given to us and preserved for us, the Holy Scriptures. The Hebrew text of the Old Testament. For the present, the problem revolves ar mostly around the thousands of different readings in the Greek New Testament manuscripts. By the time of Christ, the Old Testament was in settled condition. Since then, the Hebrew Scriptures have been carried down intact to the day of printing about 1450 A.D., by the unrivaled methods of the Jews in transmitting perfect Hebrew manuscripts. Whatever perplexing problems there are in connection with the Old Testament, these have largely been produced by translating it into Greek, known as the Septuagint, I would add, and uniting that translation to the Greek New Testament. It is around the problems of the Greek New Testament that the battle for centuries has been fought. We must therefore confine ourselves largely to the Christian era for the experience which befell the New Testament and the controversies that raged around it also befell the Old Testament. Moreover, the revisers themselves would have no one think for an instant that they use any other manuscript in revising the Old Testament than the Masoretic text the only reliable Hebrew Bible. Dr. Ellicott, chairman of the English New Testament Committee, repeatedly recommends the story of the Old Testament revisions by Dr. Chambers. Dr. Chambers says, quote, The more sober critics with one consent hold fast the Masoretic text. This has been the rule with the authors of the present revision. Their work is based throughout upon the traditional Hebrew. In difficult or doubtful places, 
where some corruption seems to have crept in or some accident to have befallen the manuscript, the testimony of the early versions is given in the margin, but never incorporated with the text. The Apostasy of the Early Christian Church Prepares the Way for Corrupting the Manuscripts Inspired by the unerring Spirit of God, chosen men brought forth the different books of the New Testament, these originally being written in Greek for a few years under the guidance of the noble apostles, believers in Christ were privileged to have the unadulterated word of God. But soon the scene changed. The fury of Satan, robed with further opportunity to harass the Son of God, robbed of further opportunity to harass the Son of God, turned upon the written word. Heretical sects, warning for, warring for supremacy, corrupted the manuscripts in order to further their ends. Epiphanius, in his polemic treatise, the Panarian describes not less than 80 heretical parties. The Roman Catholics won. The true church fled into the wilderness, taking pure manuscripts with her. When the Apostle Paul foretold the coming of the great apostasy in his sermon and later in his epistle to the Thessalonians, he declared that there would come, quote-unquote, a falling away, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. And then he added that, Quote, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, unquote. 2 Thessalonians 2.7 Later, when he had gathered together on his journey to Jerusalem, the bishops, those who were over the churches of Ephesus, he said, quote, Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch, and remember, that the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Unquote. Acts 20, 30, and 31. Though there are many important events in the life of the great apostle which have been left unrecorded, the Holy Spirit deemed it fit of high importance to put on record this prophecy to warn us, even from among the elders or bishops where would arise a perverse leadership. This prophecy would be fulfilled, was fulfilled. Until we sense the importance of this great prediction of the Holy Spirit and come to recognize its colossal fulfillment, the Bible must in many things remain a sealed book. When Paul was warned of the coming apostasy, he aroused the Thessalonians not to be soon shaken or troubled in spirit. Quote, by letter as from us, unquote. Second Thessalonians 2 2. It would have been bold at any time to write a letter to a church and sign to it the apostle's name. But how daring must have been that iniquity which would commit that forgery even while the apostles was yet alive. Even in Paul's day, the apostasy was built on lawless acts. Later in his labors, Paul specifically pointed out three ways in which the apostasy was working. Number one by exalting man's knowledge above the Bible. Number two, by spiritualizing the scriptures away. And lastly, by substituting philosophy for revelation. Number one, false knowledge exalted above scripture. Of the first of these dangers, we read as follows, quote, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane babbling, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called unquote. 1 Timothy 7:20 The Greek word in this verse which is translated science is gnosis gnosis means knowledge gnosticism The apostle condemned not knowledge in general but false knowledge false teachers were placing their own interpretations on Christian truth by reading into it human ideas. This tendency grew and increased until a great system bearing the name of Christianity, known as Gnosticism, was established. To show that this religion was not a theory without an organization among men, but that it had communities and was widespread, I quote from Milman, quote, The latter Gnostics were bolder, 
but more consistent innovators on the simple scheme of Christianity. In all the great cities of the East in which Christianity had established its most flourishing communities sprang up this rival, which is which aspired to a still higher degree of knowledge than was revealed in the gospel, and boasted that it soared almost as much above the vulgar Christianity as the vulgar paganism. The mysterious theories of these Gnostics have reappeared in the works of theologians of our day. The following words from the Americana will prove the tendency of this doctrine to break out in our times. Note the place of quote-unquote aeons in their system. Quote, There have been no Gnostic sects since the 5th century, but many of the principles of their system of emanations reappear in latter philosophical systems, drawn from the same source as theirs. Plato's lively representation had given to the idea of the Godhead something substantial, which the Gnostics transferred to their aeons, unquote. In fact, the aeons system has found a treatment in the revised version. Bishop Westcott, who is one of the dominating minds of the English New Testament Revision Committee, advocates the revised New Testament be read in light of the modern aeon theories of the revisers. He comments thus on the revised reading of Ephesians 3.21, quote, Some, perhaps, are even led to pause on the wonderful phrase in Ephesians 3.21, Margin, for all the generations of the age of the ages, which is represented in English, authorized version, by to all generations forever and ever, and reflect on the vision so open of a vast aeon of the which the elements are of our aeons unfolding, as it were, stage after stage, the manifold pow powers of one life fulfilled in many ways, each aeon, the child, so to speak, of that which has gone before. Unquote. J. H. Newman, the Oxford divine, who has made a cardinal after he had left the Church of England for the Church of Rome. It's the Oxford movement. That's where the Episcopal Church, or the uh, Anglican Church became Roman Catholic. And whose doctrines, in whole or in part, were adopted by the majority of the revisers, did more to influence the religion of the British Empire than any other man since the Reformation. He was invited to sit on the revision committee. Dr. D. S. Parker's Parks Cadman speaks thus, referring to his Gnosticism. From the fathers, Newman also derived a speculative angelology, angelology, which described the unseen universe as inhabited by hosts of intermediate beings who were spiritual agents between God and creation. Indeed, Newman's cosmogony was essentially Gnostic and echoed the teachings of Serinthius, Serinthus, who is best entitled to be considered as the link between Judaizing and Gnostic sects. The following quotation from a magazine of authority gives a description of this modern spirit species of Gnosticism, which shows its Romanizing tendency. It also reveals, reveals how Bishop Westcott could hold this philosophy while it names Dr. Philip Schaff, president of both American Committees of Revision, as even more an apostle of this modern Gnosticism. Quote, The roads which lead to Rome are very numerous. Another road, less frequented and less obvious, but not less dangerous, is the philosophical. There is a strong affinity between the speculative system of development, according to which everything that is, is true and rational, and the Romish idea of self-evolving, infallible church, of a self-evolving, infallible church. No one can read the exhibitions of the church and of theology written 
even by Protestants under the influence of that speculative philosophy, without seeing that little more than a change of terminology is required to turn such a philosophy into Romanism. Many distinguished men have already in Germany passed by this bridge from philosophical skepticism to the Romish church. A distinct class of the Romanizing portion of the Church of England belongs to this philosophical category. Dr. Nevin had entered this path long before Dr. Schaff came from Germany to point it out to him, unquote. Number two, spiritualizing the scriptures away. The next outstanding phase of the coming apostasy, spiritualizing the scriptures away, is predicted by the apostle. Now, I would add for clarification, it's allegorizing away that which is clearly intended to be literal that is a problem. There are, of course, things in the scripture, such as prophecy, that are using symbols. And, like, for instance, here's a classic example. In 1 Corinthians 3 and 6, um, the body is defined as the temple of the Holy Ghost, no longer a physical temple. So there are things that are spiritual in the New Testament that were literal in the Old Testament. But we can only go by the Word of God for those definitions, where it defines those things thus. But it's examples like taking the days of creation, the creation week, and even though they're defined as an evening and a morning, for each of the days, and saying, oh no, that's that doesn't really mean that. That's where it's spiritualizing the scriptures away, as this author would call it. Continuing on. The next, okay. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase under more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Second Timothy 2, 16-18 The Bible teaches the resurrection as a future event. One way these prominent teachers, full of vanity, could say that it is past was to teach, as some of their descendants do today, that the resurrection is a spiritual process which takes place, say, at conversion. And I would add for my buddy Aiden, this is what uh, that Eric at Shattering False Foundations was essentially teaching in his Thousand Year video. Continuing on. The prediction of the Apostle was fulfilled in a great system of Bible spiritualizing or mystifying which subverted the primitive faith, turning the scriptures into an allegory was a passion in those days. In our day, allegorizing is not only a passion, but it is also a refuge from the truth for so many leaders with whom we have to do. Because they want to reconcile their Christianity, quote-unquote, to the lies of science, which is really Roman Catholicism, because it's Big Bang Theory, all this stuff was heliocentrism created by jesuits so it's just an occult form of roman catholicism to unite the world in one religion number three substituting philosophy for scripture the third way in which the apostasy came was predicted by the apostle thus beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ, Colossians 2.8. The philosophy condemned in this passage is not the philosophy found in the sacred word, but the philosophy which is after the tradition of men. Even before the days of Christ, the very existence of the Jewish religion was threatened by intellectual leaders of the Jews who were carried away with this, the subtleties and glamour of pagan philosophy. This same temptress 
quickly ensnared the multitudes who bore the name Christian. Quote, Greek philosophy exercised the greatest influence not only on the Christian mode of thought, but also through that on the institutions of the church. In the completed church, we find again the philosophic schools, unquote. And there's uh, citations for all these. It says FA11, the previous quote, FA10, so I'm not sure where these quotations where these citations are actually meted out in detail or what or whatever so maybe we'll find those later in the meantime carrying on the greatest enemies of the infant christian church therefore were not found in the triumphant heathenism which filled the world but in the rising flood of heresy which under the name of christianity engulfed the truth for many years this was what brought on the dark ages and where are we again today? The Dark Ages. Take a look around at the world. It's not a coincidence. This rising flood, as we shall see, had multiplied in abundance copies of the scriptures with bewildering changes in verses and passages with 100 years after the death of John, 100 AD. As Irenaeus said concerning Marcion, the Gnostic, quote, Wherefore, also Marcion and his followers have betaken themselves to mutilating the scriptures, not acknowledging some of the books at all, and curtailing the gospel according to Luke and the epistles of Paul, they assert that these alone are authentic, which they themselves have shortened. Unquote. So in other words, picking and choosing which verses, which books are inspired. Ultimately, it goes back to Marcion the Gnostic. Continuing on. Fundamentally, there are only two streams of Bibles. Anyone who is interested enough to read the vast volume of literature on this subject will agree that down through the centuries, there were only two streams of manuscripts. The first stream, which, was, which carried the received text in Hebrew and Greek, began with the apostolic churches and reappearing at intervals down the Christian era among enlightened believers was protected by the wisdom and scholarship of the pure church in her different phases, by such as the church at Pela in Palestine where Christians fled when in 70 AD the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. And there is a citation there, F.A. 13. By the Syrian church of Antioch, which produced eminent scholarship, by the Italic Church in North Italy, and also, by the same time, by the Gaelic Church in Southern France, and by the Celtic Church in Great Britain, by the pre-Waldensian, the Waldensian, and the churches of the Reformation. The first stream appears with very little change. In the Protestant Bibles of many languages and in English, in the Bible known as the King James Version, the one which has been in use for 300 years in the English-speaking world. These manuscripts have an agreement with them, by far the vast majority of numbers. So vast is this majority that the enemies of the received text admit that 19, that 19 twentieths and some 19 nine one hundreds of all Greek manuscripts are of this class while 100% of the Hebrew manuscripts are for the received text. Okay, so 19 out of 20 and some 99 out of 100 of all Greek manuscripts back what makes up the King James Bible and 100% of the Hebrew agree with the Hebrew of the King James. The second stream is a small one of a very few manuscripts. These last manuscripts are represented, A, in Greek, the Vatican Manuscript or Codex B in the library at Rome, and Sinaitic or Codex Aleph, hashtag, its brother, which was found in a trash bin at the St. Catherine's Monastery, which I believe is also Catholic. We will fully explain about these two manuscripts later. B. In Latin. The Vulgate or Latin Bible of Jerome. 
C in English. The Jesuit Bible of 1582. I believe that's the Dewey Rames. Which latter with vast changes is seen in the Dewey or Catholic Bible. So the, the Dewey be, was from this Jesuit Bible evidently. D in English again. In many modern Bibles which introduce practically all the Catholic readings of the Latin Vulgate which were rejected by the Protestants of the Reformation among these prominently are the revised versions. So the modern Bibles are Roman Catholic. So the present controversy between the King James Bible and English and the modern versions is the same old contest fought out between the early church and the rival sects, later between the Waldenses and the Papists from the 4th to the 13th centuries, and later still between the Reformers and the Jesuits in the 16th century. I believe um, he's going to meet this concept out in more detail in the next chapter. Pretty sure. The Apostle Paul prepares to preserve the truth against the coming apostasy. In his later years, the Apostle Paul spent more time in preparing the churches for the great future apostasy than in pushing the, the work further on. He foresaw that this apostasy would arise in the West, because it had to based on Daniel's prophecies. Therefore, he spent years laboring to anchor the Gentile churches of Europe to the churches of Judea. The Jewish Christians had back of them 1,500 years of training. Throughout the centuries, God had so molded the Jewish mind that it grasped the idea of sin, an invisible Godhead, of man's serious condition, of the need for a divine Redeemer. But throughout these same centuries, the Gentile world had sunk lower and lower in fr frivolity, heathenism, and debauchery. And I would have to kind of disagree with this author here because we find that in the time of Christ, that basically the Jews of his day were just as apostatized um, and had uh, amalgamated all sorts of paganism in their religion from Babylon. And the Bible bears witness to this in Ezekiel and, and other places. It is worthy of notice, then, that the Apostle Paul wrote practic practically all of his epistles to the Gentile churches, to Corinth, to Rome, to Philippi, etc. He wrote almost no letters to the Jewish Christians. Therefore, the great burden of his closing days was to anchor the Gentile churches of Europe to the Christian churches of Judea. In fact, it was to secure this end that he lost his life. Now, obviously, the, the Jewish believers in Christ weren't apostate. St. Paul did his best to maintain his friendship and alliance with the Jerusalem church. To put himself right with them, he traveled up to Jerusalem when fresh fields and splendid prospects were opening up for him in the west. For this purpose, he submitted to several days of restraint and attendance in the temple, and the results vindicated his determination. That was a quote. F.A. 14. <clears throat> This is how Paul used churches in Judea as a base. Quote, For ye, brethren, become followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Unquote. 1 Thessalonians 2.14 Quote, There is not a word here of the church of Rome being the model after which the other churches were to be formed. It has no such preeminence. This honor belonged to the churches of Judea. It was according to them, not the church at Rome, that the Asiatic churches were modeled. The purest of all the apostolic churches was that of the Thessalonians, and this was formed after the Christian churches in Judea. Had any preeminence or authority belonged to the church of Rome, the apostle would have proposed this as a model of all those which he formed, either in Judea, Asia Minor, Greece, or Italy. Amen. Unquote. That comes from F.A. 15, whatever citation that is. 
I'm we're confined to a Kindle here. Um, working on getting a printer here to be able to print these books out. Uh, for the for these exact reasons to be able to flip back and forth between indexes and stuff, and to make notes. But uh, for the time being, for this reading, I'm confined to a Kindle, so I I'm unable to specify where these quotes come from but they are cited early corruptions of bible manuscripts the last of the apostles to pass away was john his death is usually placed about 100 a.d in his closing days he cooperated in the collecting and forming of those writings of the new testament there's a citation there fa 16 an ordinary careful reading of Acts chapter 15 will prove the scrupulous care with which the early church guarded her sacred writings. And so well did God's true people through the ages agree on what was scripture and what was not, that no general council of the church until that of Trent, Roman Catholic, 1645 Counter-Reformation, dominated by the Jesuits, dare to say anything as to what books should compromise the Bible or what texts uh, were or were not spurious. And now remember, the Council of Trent, fourth session, condemns the Bibles um, in the common languages of people, anything other than the Latin Bible, and it also says that you must receive the Apocrypha books or be condemned. While John lived, heresy could make no serious headway. He had hardly passed away, however, before perverse teachers infested the Christian church, the doom of heathenism, as a controlling force between the superior truths of Christianity was soon foreseen by all. These years were times which the New Testament books corrupted in abundance which saw the New Testament books corrupted in abundance. Eusebius, in witness to this fact, he also relates that the corrupted manuscripts were so prevalent that agreement between the copies was hopeless, and that those who were corrupting the scriptures claimed that they really were correcting them. And there's a citation there, F.A. 18. When the warring sects had been consolidated under the iron hand of Constantine, the heretical potentate adopted the Bible, which combined the contradictory versions into one, and so blended the various corruptions with the bulk of pure teachings as to give sanction to the great apostasy now seated on the throne of power. Being shortly after the death of the Apostle John, four names stand out in prominence, whose teachings contributed both to the victorious heresy and to the final issuing of manuscripts of a corrupt New Testament. These names are 1. Justin Martyr 2. Tatian 3. Clement of Alexandria and 4. Origen We shall speak first of John Martyr. The year which the Apostle John died, 100 AD, is given as the date which Justin Martyr was born. Justin, originally a pagan and of pagan parentage, afterward embraced Christianity, and although he is said to have died at heathen hands for his religion, nevertheless, his teachings were of a heretical nature. Even as a Christian teacher, he continued to wear the robes of a pagan philosopher. In the teachings of Justin Martyr, we begin to see how muddy the stream of pure Christian doctrine was running among the heretical sects 50 years after the death of John, uh, the Apostle John. It was in Tatian, Justin Martyr's pupil, that these regrettable doctrines were carried to alarming lengths and by his hand committed to writing. After the death of Justin Martyr in Rome, Tatian returned to Palestine and embraced the Gnostic heresy. This same Tatian wrote a harmony of the Gospels, which was called the diates diatessaron, meaning four in one. The Gospels were so notoriously corrupted by his hand that in the latter years of 
a bishop of Syria, because of the errors, was obliged to throw out of his churches no less than 200 copies of this diatessaron, since the church members were mistaking it for the true gospel. Uh, it's citation F.A. 19. We come now to Tatian's pupil, known as Clement of Alexandria, 200 A.D., F.A. 20. Citation F.A. 20. He went much farther than Tatian in that he founded a school at Alexandria which instituted propaganda along these heretical lines. And this school at Alexandria, is, I'm almost positive, is where the Septuagint comes from. And maybe this author will meet that out. Clement expressly tells us that he would not hand down Christian teachings pure and unmixed, but rather clothed with precepts of pagan philosophy. All the writings of the outstanding heretical teachers were possessed by Clement, and he freely quoted their corrupted manuscripts, as if they were the pure words of Scripture. That's citation F.A. 21, it looks like. His influence in the deprivation of Christianity was tremendous. But his greatest contribution undoubtedly was the direction given to the studies and activities of Origen, his famous pupil. pupil. When we come to Origen, we speak the name of him who did the most of all to create and give direction to the forces of apostasy down through the centuries. It was he who mightily influenced Jerome, the editor of the Latin Bible known as the Vulgate. Eusebius worshipped at the altar of Origen's teachings. He, he claims to have collected 800 of Origen's letters, to have used Origen's six-column Bible and hexapla in his biblical and the, the hexapla, whatever that is, in his biblical labors, assisted by Pamphilius, he restore, restored and preserved Origen's library, the occult library. Origen's corrupted manuscripts of the scriptures were well arranged and balanced with subtlety. Hard to discern, in other words. The last 100 years have seen much of the so-called scholarship of the European and English Christianity dominated by the subtle and powerful influence of Origen. Origen had so surrendered himself to the, to the furor of turning all Bible events into allegories, like the Creation Week, that he himself says, quote, The scriptures are of little use to those who understand them as they are written. Unquote. Uh, citation FA-22. In order to estimate Origen rightly, we must remember that as a pupil of Clement, he learned the teachings of the Gnostic heresy and, like his master, lightly esteemed the historical basis of the Bible. Kind of like Jesuit futurist interpretation of prophecy. It says the Antichrist is yet future. Rejects the historical basis. And an eschatology created by the Jesuits Robert Bellarmine and Francisco Rivera. As Schaff says, quote, His predilection, predilection for Plato, the pagan, pagan philosopher, led him into many grand and fascinating errors, unquote. That's citation F.A. 23. He made himself acquainted with the various heresies and studied under the heathen Ammonius Saccas, founder of Neoplatonism. He taught that the soul existed from eternity before it inhabited the body, and that after death it migrated to a higher or a lower form of life according to the deeds done in the body. And finally, all would return to the state of pure intelligence, only to begin again the same cycle as before. He believed that the devils would be saved. <laughs> and that the stars and planets had souls, and were, like men, on trial to learn perfection. In fact, he turned the whole law and gospel into an allegory. Such was the man from his day to this has dominated 
the endeavors of destructive textual critics. One of the greatest results of his life was that his teachings became the foundation of that system of education called scholasticism, which guided the colleges of Latin Europe for nearly 1,000 years during the Dark Ages. And in uh, Charles Trinique's 50 Years in the Church of Rome, he talks about how in, how in seminary, they had these priests reading uh, all these pagan philosophers. They weren't having them study the Bible. Originism flooded the Catholic Church through Jerome, the father of Latin Christianity. Quote, I love the name of Origen, unquote, says the most distinguished theologian of the Roman Catholic Church since 1850. Quote, I will not listen to the notion that so great a soul was lost, unquote. And there's site, that's F.A. 24. A final word from the learned Scrivener will indicate how early and how deep were the corruptions of the sacred manuscripts. Quote, It is no less true to fact than paradoxical and sound that the worst corruptions to which the New Testament has ever been subjected originated within a hundred years after it was composed. That Irenaeus, A.D. 150, and the African fathers and the whole Western with a portion of the Syri Syrian church used far inferior manuscripts to those employed by Stunichia or Erasmus or Stephen's 13th century later when molding the Texas Receptus. There's a citation there, F.A. 25. The basis was laid to oppose a mutilated Bible to the true one. How these corruptions found their way down the centuries and reappear in our revised and modern Bibles, the following pages will tell. And that ends chapter 1.